Peace be to you, the reader. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Wisdom, let us arise, let us hear the Holy Gospel. Peace be with all. And with your spirit. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Let us be attentive. Glory to you, O Lord. Glory to you. At that time, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. And she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made straight, and she praised God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And then the Lord answered him, You hypocrite! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his ass from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as Jesus said this, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Glory to you, <clears throat> O Lord. Glory to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. This is from the book of Ephesians, which is my favorite book in the Bible. So, I will say again, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean? It's, it's really quite astonishing once we comprehend it. And it's this. The light of Christ shining on the world is even greater than the sun coming up every day and bathing it in light and warmth. The sun rises every day, and it gives its light, and it gives its warmth, it gives its energy to the whole world. It's what keeps it alive. Christ is the same way. Everything that the Lord has, could possibly do has been done. Well, then why don't we see it? Why don't we see it? Because we have to wake up. Awake, O sleeper. Awake, O sleeper, to the light that Christ has given us. Think about this. It's very important. Everything that God could have done to restore the communion between Him and His creation has been done. There's nothing else he can do. He destroyed death. What is death? Death describes our estrangement, our separation from him. And it's manifested in, in, in the creation in a lot of different ways. It's manifested in our physical death, the separation of the soul from the body. It's manifested in 
the estrangement we have with others. It's also manifested in the estrangement we have with ourselves. And it's actually with ourselves that the restoration begins, which is to say that we can experience the grace, mercy, love, power of God as He intended from the beginning and as His resurrection restored. That's really what it is. Why? Because the power of that estrangement, what caused that estrangement, what caused that death, what caused that separation has been destroyed. The power of the devil. The power of the devil. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Hebrews, the thing that keeps us separated from God right now is, is the fear of death. The fear of death. Because death itself has been destroyed. Now does that mean that, that, that we don't die? No, it doesn't mean that. What it means is that death itself becomes an occasion for life. And we see that at the end of our life that death now becomes a doorway into the very presence of God. I like to say that death no longer is a dead end, but it's a doorway. But also the little deaths in this life that can be transformed as occasions for life. And so rather than running away from the darkness of death, with fear, what we, really have to, what we really have to do, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking, is put death to death inside us. In other words, the death that reigns in us has to be put to death, because if that death that reigns in us is put, put to death, then that process becomes the doorway into greater life. That's how it works. So, awake, O oh sleeper. He's talking to us. <laughs> awake, awake, awake. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Because the Lord is with you and the Lord is around you in the same way that the light of the sun that rises every morning is. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, we call that the spiritual life. We call that the spiritual struggle. But let me give you the baseline where it all begins. It begins with two commandments. Everything can be distilled to two commandments. And the second commandment, the Lord tells us in the book of Matthew, is as important as the first. But I'm going to give you the first one first. But understand that the second is just as important. Love God with all your heart, soul, body, mind, and strength. And commandment number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Strive to comprehend, strive to understand, and strive to do. And I'll tell you, the, 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 the whole substance of what we call the spiritual life will start becoming clearer. It really will. Because if we love God, we will be compelled to love our neighbor. If we try to love our neighbor, we will be compelled to love God because they're inseparable. Why are they inseparable? Because God himself is love. Love is the vivifying and unifying energy of the universe. It really is. It really is. Love is what created the energy and the power of the sun, which gives incredible biological life, life to all things. But the love of God vivifies even that power and lies below it and gives all things its substance and its coherence and its meaning. It's the reason why we even exist. It comes down to that because God is love. And so when we attempt, when we attempt to love the neighbor, we're moving closer to God. If we're moving closer to God, we will move closer to our neighbor. You can't love God and hate your neighbor. It's impossible. In the end, you will quit loving God. You can't hate God and love your neighbor. 
Because in the end, you're going to quit hating God and you're going to love him too. That's what's going to happen. They're inseparable. They really are. That's why in the gospel reading today, think about that. Really think about the gospel reading and what it means. Here, they see the Lord releasing a woman with an, a spirit of infirmity. With them. She's hunched over. When I was young, you know, I wish you, you don't see it so much today because medical, medical, um, just medical, because of medical advancements. When I was young, I would see, I would see old men walking like this a lot more than I do today. They would walk like this. And I think to myself, why don't they straighten up and walk normal? And then I, I got older and I realized they can. They can. They're just walking like this because they're tired. They're walking like this because they can't straighten up. And that was this woman, 18 years. She's walking like this. You can imagine how difficult that must have been. And Jesus brings healing to her, and what happens? The rulers of the synagogue grow indignant, the scripture tells us, because he healed on the Sabbath. That's, that's just nonsense. It's hypocrisy. It really is, and that's what Jesus said. You hypocrites, you're better to your animals than you are to, to this woman. You grow indignant with me because I healed this woman? You treat your cattle better than you do her. And that's how he responded to her, and he was angry about it. But you think about this. You think about this. What truncated thinking is operating in the minds of these people who were charged with preaching the word of God, that they would use this word to condemn him who not only wrote the law, but is the law, and brought his love and healing to a woman who was, was burdened for 18 years. What is it? What is it that can distort someone's thinking to that degree where they criticize Christ for the healing that he accomplished? Well, the answer is this. It's the darkness of the heart. It's the darkness of the heart. It's choosing to be asleep rather than awake. It's choosing to turn, to turn the heart off towards the light, to close the doors rather than letting the light in. And if a person does that, as the people in the scripture, the leader of the synagogues did, as the scripture tells us, things get distorted. And these were distorted men because they went after the one who healed and they didn't rejoice in the healing and the goodness that was evident through it, but instead criticized him for doing it on the wrong day of the week. I mean, the small-mindedness in there is, is just astonishing. But what's worse, as what Christ said, is the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of it, because they would treat, they would treat their animals better than they would a daughter of Abraham, a daughter of the living God. The warning there, then, to us is, don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Because if we do close our eyes, the distortion will enter. If I take this poinsettia, and if I put it in the bathroom or in the closet, and I, I close the door, what's going what's to happen? It's going to become distorted. It can't possibly become what it was created to be. It'll get spindly. It won't look beautiful. And in the end, it will die. So it is with our hearts. But if I take the plant out and I put it back into the sunlight and I prune it 
and I take care of it, and I give it water, and I give it a little fertilizer, you know what's going to happen? The plant is going to recover itself and then grow into what it was created to be and will become beautiful once again. So it is with us. Awake, O oh sleeper, cultivate the soil of your heart. <coughs> Rejoice in that which is good and do well. Do well because God himself will give you light. So through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, may the Lord have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. Please rise.